Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lowell Observatory's live stream on the Geminids Meteor Shower. Uh, this is one of the rather big showers of the year, so hopefully we'll get to see a couple of meteors in the LDT All Sky camera. My name is Megan Jaluka. I'm a research assistant here at Lowell Observatory, and I work with astronomer Dr. Nick Moskovitz, who is here with me tonight. Um, and additionally, we are joined by Dr. Vishnu Reddy, who is an associate professor at the Lunar and Pla Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona. So we're really excited to have him with us tonight. Thanks so much for being here, Vishnu. Um, on your screen right now, you should see the LDT All Sky camera. So it's uh, constantly updating. I believe it's about every minute or so. Um, so if there are any meteors, hopefully we'll see those go by on the, on the camera and we'll point those out to you as we see them. In the meantime, uh, I think we're gonna begin with a presentation from Dr. Reddy. Uh, so I will hand it off to you. And as always, if anybody has any questions, feel free to post them in the comments and we'll get to them as fast as we can. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Nick, do you wanna share my slides? Yep, I'm getting that pulled up right now. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, I think this evening we're gonna look at how uh, Gemini Meteor, uh, meteorites and a uh, meteor shower forms actually, uh, and its relationship with uh, a few of the asteroids that we have in the inner solar system. So my talk is going to be about uh, Phaethon and 2005 UD uh, parent bodies of Gemini meteor shower. So uh, can we go to the next slide? Okay, I'm still seeing the first slide. Nick? Yeah, my screen is not refreshing, so. Okay, can you guys see that? Let me try again. I'm gonna to try to refresh it. Sorry sure. about this. No, no worries. Okay, there you go. Yeah, I can see it. Good. Okay, uh, so 3200 Phaethon. So this is the object that we're going to learn about today. Uh, the number 3200 basically um, is, is, is the order in which this asteroid has been numbered. So whenever you discover an asteroid, you get a provisional designation. So you might have heard about uh, this uh, rocket body that came by. It was called 2020 SO. So over the course of many years, uh, as you get more observations and the orbit becomes um, more clear and the risk of us losing that object becomes negligible, uh, the minor planner center designates, it gives it a number. So in this case, 3200 was the, uh, was the number that was given to this object. And then of course, you know, Phaethon is the name of the object. Uh, so Phaethon is actually the son of the uh, Greek solar deity Helios. And so there's some mythology uh, associated with that name. I will let you guys uh, Google that on Wikipedia, and there's a nice story about it. You can you can look into it. Unlike most asteroids that are discovered today, uh, Phaethon was actually discovered by a satellite and not a ground-based telescope. Uh, so we have telescopes on the Earth right now that discovered asteroids, like the Catalina Sky Survey in uh, in Arizona, and the Pan-STARRS telescope in Hawaii, and of course you got the Neowise telescope, that's a space-based infrared telescope. But before all of these uh, uh, surveys were there, uh, there was a satellite called IRAS. Uh, and this satellite, you can see a picture of it on the right side, uh, for uh, you know, amateur astronomers, it, it had a mirror of about 22 inches. So a fairly lar large infrared telescope. It, it took pictures of the sky in four different wavelengths. And actually astronomers looking through uh, the images of, uh, taken by this uh, satellite uh, found Phaethon. So uh, Phaethon is relatively large. Uh, for a near-Earth asteroid, it's about 3.6 miles across. Uh, that we know from the observations made at the uh, Arecibo radar. We'll see pictures of it shortly. Um, the interesting part about uh, Phaethon itself uh, is that it gets very, very close to the sun. And so to give you an idea, uh, it gets within 13 million miles of the sun. Uh, so in, in comparison, Mercury, which is the innermost uh, uh, planet that we have in our solar system, gets to within 29 miles of the uh, sun. 
So it gets much, much closer to the uh, sun than Mercury does. And I think if you can play the video on the right side, if you click on it, uh, Nick, it, it might run. See if it works. If not, you know, that's fine. I just have yeah, I'm have, let me, I'm going to restart the presentation one more time this sure. year. I'm sorry. I'm having yeah, no worries. Is the yeah. Screen share. I'm not entirely sure what's going on. Let me try one more time here. The video is playing on my machine, but not. Sure. Um, all right. While you're getting things sorted out, uh, we had a question from Anthony um, about if the meteor shower will be seen um, in ISRO. So I'm assuming from India then. Um, yeah. And the answer is yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It'll be seen everywhere. It will be visible anywhere on this clear sky. So. All right. Sorry, Vishnu. No, no worries. Like I said, you know, it's, still, ar it, it's still early in the evening, so we're, we're good. So, yeah. <laughs> See if you can play just here, can you? Yeah, I, so I think this will work. I'm not going to be able to be in presenter mode, but I can play Yeah, they, the, you can play that and see if it... So what you see in the little animation on the right side is you got uh, the planets, the, the teal color, teal blue color is Mercury, and then you have Venus in green, uh, and then Earth, and then red is in Mars, right? And then this purple um, line that you see that's going, you know, kind of from inside you know, all the way up. So the lines you see vertically are basically uh, indicates the the inclination or uh, how how much it is off from the plane of the solar system. So that purple uh, uh, curve that you guys see there is the orbit of Phaeton itself. So uh, not only is it uh, very elliptical, as you can see compared to the planets, it's also very inclined to the plane of the solar system. So in other words, uh, when Phaeton actually gets you know close to the sun it's actually kind of dipping into the uh, solar system plane and then it goes off. And that has its own challenges when you're trying to do a spacecraft mission. I think, uh, you know, Nick, I think you're gonna talk about Destiny Plus, so that, that, that'll that be an interesting thing. So I just want people to remember that uh, aspect of it. Um, and because of, of, of how close it gets to the sun, uh, it has some very interesting surface properties. It gets really hot, uh, about uh, 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and so, you know, the normal uh, surface uh, processes we see on other asteroids, for example, that are exposed to the coldness of space are not necessarily happening on an object like Phaeton. So whenever it comes into the inner solar system, dips really close to the sun, its surface gets kind of thinner, so to speak. And that has some implications for why we see geminids uh, from Phaeton itself. And then again, it goes back to the cold, coldness of space as it goes into uh, aphelion or the first point. Uh, to the sun. Uh, Phaeton itself does not threaten the Earth. Uh, it, it gets only within 1.8 million miles of the Earth, so there is no threat of it actually impacting the Earth, although for a relatively large object, it gets pretty close to the Earth. And that's why uh, every so often we get a chance to you know, observe it with telescopes uh, from the Earth, you know, like, uh, like the, uh, uh, the Discovery uh, Telescope that we'll refer to. Uh, the orbital period of Phaeton, so, you know, Earth goes around the sun once every 365 days or so. So, same thing, Phaeton takes about 524 days to go around the sun. So, that's how much it takes uh, to go from the same point on that purple curve that you guys see on the right side uh, and coming back to the same point, about, you know, a little under, you know, uh, twice as much as that of a, a typical Earth year. Okay, next slide. So I'm just gonna interrupt for one second. If sure. we look at the LDT All Sky camera real quickly, I don't think it's a meteor, but it's a cool thing to point out is that we did have an object sort of pass through the field of view there. Um, okay, Nick, do you good. see that? I think it's an airplane or a satellite because it looks like a pretty steady line across the whole screen. Oh, it just went away from me. But. Yeah, I think that's a satellite. Um, you can see it'll show up in the next frame a bit off to the left of the main streak there. Mm -hmm. and so when the next frame of the, the all sky camera shows up, uh, you'll see the, the satellite trail has moved to a different part of the sky. Um, and yeah, that's you know one of the most common things we see. One of the most contaminant, common contaminants that we see in this all sky camera is when we're looking for meteors, we'll be seeing 
planes and satellites whizzing by all night. Awesome, thank you. I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Vishnu. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so how does Phaethon look uh, uh, if you look through a telescope? So, so on the left side, I think, uh, Nick, if you play it, if you take pictures of the sky and if you kind of uh, create an animation, you know, over the course of say an hour, this is what you would see. You know, you align all the pictures you took with, with the stars. The stars are not moving, but you can see this uh, bright white dot that goes from the bottom left to the top right. And that is basically uh, Phaethon, so this, this so-called parent body of um, Gemini meteor shower. And on the right side, I think you can play that as well. I think it's a video, maybe not. Oh, there it is. So on the right side, what you see are uh, radar images uh, from the famous uh, Arecibo uh, radar facility uh, in Puerto Rico. So what you're seeing here is uh, the radar beam illuminating uh, Phaethon. So think of, think of you as being on the North Pole of Phaethon, for example. And then what you see is uh, the radar beam coming from your top of your screen, like a flashlight, and illuminating the surface. And, and, and since Phaethon is rotating on its own axis, just like the Earth does, uh, you can see different parts come into view uh, and they're getting illuminated by uh, by this radar beam. So as you know, astronomers send out radar pulses uh, to the surface, and they can try and create uh, images of it based upon uh, you know the time difference between the pulse they send out and the time you know when it comes back. The same pulse comes back, so you can tell the surface features from that. And you can see there are some you know concavities or you know possibly craters on the surface. That's what you see in this picture. So for a typical amateur astronomer uh, aimed at the small telescope, Phaethon would look like a dot. And of course, with uh, powerful uh, radar facilities like the one in Puerto Rico, uh, you would see an image like that. And similarly with you know, other facilities like Goldstone Radar in California. So next slide. Uh, so there are other uh, asteroids. So there's another asteroid called 2005 UD. And it's, it's been called as mini Phaethon. Okay, and the reason of that is that if you look at the uh, picture on the top right, it is a small uh, picture that shows the orbit of the Earth in a black circle, and then this the orbit of Phaethon in red, and 2005 UD is the green circle. I know it's kind of hard to see because of, there's a blue line for a different asteroid. Uh, so there's three asteroid orbits indicated there. Uh, so 2005 UD uh, shares similar orbital properties uh, as Phaethon. And if, if, when astronomers try to backtrack this orbit uh, 46, you know, 100 years ago, they felt that you know maybe 2005 UD split off from Phaethon and, and, and became its own um, object, you know, either you know due to the intense heat or due to you know gravitational interaction with planets in the inner solar system. We're not quite sure, but one thing is that it's possible in the distant past that 2005 UD actually came off Phaethon. And it has formed its own meteor shower. It, they call the daytime uh, sextantids. Um, and so the question is, you know, is 2005 UD part of Phaethon? The orbit looks similar. It has its own meteor shower. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. And th this, I, I mentioned that there's a third object in the plot on the right side, the tiny plot. Uh, it's called 1999YC. It also seems to share similar orbital properties as Phaethon, uh, as you can see. But this, the, the link between 2005 UD and Phaethon is still kind of, uh, you know, it's up in the air. So compositionally, so uh, on the bottom right side is, is, a, is a plot that shows the spectrum, you know, so-called, um, you know, when you take, you know, when we showed a picture of Phaethon in the previous slide where it looked like a white dot, right? Because it's reflecting sunlight. It doesn't have its own source of light. So it's pretty much reflecting sunlight and whatever reflects off that 3.6 mile object is what you're seeing, you know, with your eye. Suppose you take that light and you, you run it through a prism, you know, and you split, split it into different wavelengths, different colors of light, and that's what you get is a spectrum. So in this plot on the bottom uh, right side, you see the blue curve, that is the light coming off Phaethon, but in different colors. Uh, what color depends upon the wavelength, which is on the bottom axis. So if you go from left to right, it goes from the, you know, from what you call as the uh, red end of the spectrum and to the infrared. 
So these are wavelengths that we cannot normally see. Um, you know, there are certain uh, animals in the animal kingdom that can sense an infrared. For example, rattlesnakes can see an infrared. That's how they track prey. So this is in, in a region that we cannot see with our naked eye, with, with our human eyes, let's say. That. And similarly, when you take the same light coming off uh, 2005 UD and you pass it through a prism or a spectrometer and you split the light, you get the, um, the, the, the orange yellow curve that you see on the top. So now naturally, if these objects were split and they came off the same object, you know, you would expect 2005 UD to have the same colors as Phaeton, but it doesn't. Uh, conversely, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, Nick, your postdoc has done some work that show that at least the surface properties, you know, in terms of polarization, they seem to match with that of Phaeton. So one of the things we're doing right now, this, this work that I show here is done by one of my graduate students, uh, Teddy Coretta. What we're trying to do is that, is it possible that Phaeton and UD are actually related, but one had a different thermal history? In other words, one got hot more often than the other, you know, which would make sense, right? Phaeton has been going around the sun for a lot longer than 2005 UD, which has only been going around the sun as its own entity only for the last you know, 4,600 years or so. Is it possible that the intense heat that one object had experienced has you know, changed these spectral properties? So what we're doing is that you know, we take the meteorites that are most analogous to these objects, so carbonaceous chondrites, these are dark meteorites, and we're actually heating them to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit and trying to see how the spectra change with temperature as you, you know, kind of center these meteorites into nothingness, essentially. You know, the whole thing glows hot. It's pretty impressive when you do it in the lab, when you heat meteorites. Um, so anyway, so that's the little story with 2005 UV. So next slide. Uh, so how, how, how do we know that Phaethon and Geminids are related? So that's, a, you know, that's, uh, that's been uh, postulated for a while, obviously. Uh, when, when astronomers went and uh, looked at uh, Phaeton, it doesn't have quite the tail like a comet would. You know, you've seen comet Neowise over the summer with naked eye, you know, it was very bright. But you don't see that spectacular tail like we see with comets. But they've seen debris come off it. So in, in this picture on the left side, uh, Dave Jewett at uh, UCLA, he has made some observations uh, of Phaeton. This contour map that you see here shows that something trailing uh, Phaeton itself. So eventually the material coming off Phaeton would have its, you know, would, would spread up across the orbit, like the picture you see on the right side. And typically when the earth passes through this debris field uh, every so often, uh, you, end, you end up with a meteor shower. So in, in the case of uh, the Phaeton debris, the part of the sky uh, where we cross, uh, where we mean the earth crosses the orbit of Phaeton, is in the direction of constellation of Gemini, and that's why we call it Gemini. Uh, so that's what you see on the right side. Uh, this becomes a little bit clearer in the next slide. So astronomers like you know Nick, you know when they take the the all sky pictures that you've been we've been watching from time to time, and you try and construct the orbits of these meteors that you see in the camera, right? What you see is is is, is it burning up in the atmosphere? But if you extend it back into the into the solar system, you can see, you can trace its path. You can predict where it would have gone furthest out and come back. So you can get orbits of these meteors uh, from these camera observations. And so in the picture on the left side, what you see is uh, the orbits of multiple Geminids from the 2013 uh, observations. So those are the red ones that you see and the orbit of Phaeton itself overlaid on top of it. So as you can see, they share an orbital link uh, and more interestingly, recent observations, so a couple of years ago, uh, there's a, a solar uh, spacecraft called the Parker Solar Probe. It's the closest that, uh, spacecraft that comes uh, to the sun. So it makes multiple passes of the sun to study the sun. And as it was uh, doing that, it made some observations. And what you see here is on the right side, you see a gray noise there. And of course you see some kind of a coronal mass ejection at the number zero on the left side axis. There's a little white streak like a comet sticking out. So that's part of the sun. But if you carefully look at the bottom right side, you see some blue lines. And if you trace those blue lines to the white diamond that you see, you see a faint white trail. And those are basically the fragments coming off uh, uh, Phaeton 
that are, that are trailing across uh, the orbit uh, of Phaethon itself, you know. So this is one of the most direct evidence we have that there's debris coming off Phaethon that is spreading across its orbit. And that is what we are kind of passing through tonight, you know, as we speak. Uh, and they are, you know, these, these dust particles, uh, no smaller than, you know, uh, uh, you know, grains of sand, that's all we're looking at. And the interesting part about the Geminids itself is that they're relatively, you know, uh, uh, slow meteors, uh, so we can, you know, enjoy them. You know, typical uh, speeds are in the, you know, somewhere between twenty and forty kilometers range. Unlike the Leonids that happened, you know, a month ago, which are much faster. Uh, given that, you know, these are uh, asteroidal meteors. You know, this is the only meteor shower we have that comes from an asteroid. Although this asteroid seemed to be, you know, falling apart uh, for many reasons. So that's all I had about the history of. Uh, uh, Phaethon and its parent body uh, as a Geminis uh, meteor shower. So I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Professor Eddie. Um, now we're going to switch back over to the All Sky camera and answer some of the questions that came in. So the number one uh, thing I was seeing is that people want to know sort of the when, where, who of the meteor shower tonight. So um, just so you guys know, the meteor shower started days ago. Today is its peak, and it's going to be going for days after this. So even if you have clouds tonight in your local area, you should still be able to go out tomorrow night or even the night after, or even the night after that, and still see a fair amount of Geminids. Uh, additionally, the Geminid meteor shower can be seen all over the world. Right, We're all traveling through this meteoroid stream of rocks and debris together. The entire world so we're all gonna see it um, and then as for what time um, it's actually a pretty common myth that meteor showers get much much better after midnight it mostly depends on the moon and we kind of lucked out tonight because it's a new moon on the 14th tomorrow so you should be able to have really good views of the meteor shower pretty much all night um, the later it the better but Really, if you were to go out right now and view, you would still get some pretty good views, provided that you're in a clear area. Um, do you guys want to add anything on to that? No, I would, yeah, absolutely. You know, find a clear dark site to watch. And I think you're going to talk a little bit about that later, Megan, that, you know, it's important to, to get yourself away from any lights that would make it hard to see the meteors. Um, as for the number of meteors that you can expect tonight, you know, as Megan said, this is the peak and the peak of the peak is around 2 a.m. or so. And that's actually true no matter where you are on Earth, whether you're here in Arizona, whether you're in Europe, whether you're in Asia, it doesn't matter. The peak is uh, 2 a.m. local time for you. And the peak tonight will probably be around 150 meteors per hour, something like that. So every minute or so, you'd see one or two meteors, which is pretty good. That's uh, one of the things for meteor watching is you need a bit of patience. And uh, as was said earlier, this is one of the best showers of the year. So you don't have to be too patient, uh, but um, it, it, is, uh, it is a good opportunity to catch one of the better showers of the year tonight. Yeah, and I think this morning, you know, we got up around three uh, to, to take a look at it. And even within an hour, we saw about 30 of them. And then remember, like, even if it's 150 per hour, it's over the entire sky. So obviously, our eyes cannot see all parts of the sky. So if you have uh, family members, you, you have to make a choice. You can all sit and look at the same direction so you can enjoy and point to each other. Or you can, you know, face four different directions and try and catch everything and then keep a count that way. So, you know, uh, me and my wife, we decided to look at the same direction because we wanted to you know, talk about what we were seeing. But again, like I said, it's over the entire sky. Some of them will be low on the horizon. So, you know, numbers vary. But, you know, like I said, it's a slow meteor shower. So you can, you know, kind of take your time to look at it and actually point to your family members that like, hey, look at that. And by the time they turn their head, it's still going. So you can, you have the opportunity to do that. And, and of course, you know, you got to dress warmly no matter where you are. Uh, so it was in the 40s here in Tucson, but, you know, Again, dress warmly and, you know, find something to lie down and you can, you know, watch and, you know, you can keep going back and forth inside and outside the house if you need to warm up because it keeps going. It's not like you need to be at the specific time to see it because it's a debris cloud that we're going to go through. And the density of meteors depend upon where the, the pieces that came off Phaethon are spread, or how they spread across. So it's, it's kind of, you know, there's some models that predicted, but 
it's kind of random. So, you know, take your chance. Anytime is as good. Uh, so, you know, try it out. Yeah. And the other, the, your comment about it being random is a good point, Fish, too, because that's one of the exciting things about meteor showers. We try to model them and predict what's going to happen. And models almost always fail, right? You, you get close, but uh, we are continually surprised by what meteor showers can do. Um, meteor showers can outburst and surprise you with you know, far more than the models predicted. They can go the other way as well. You may have far fewer than the predicted. Um, as for the numbers of meteors, you know, that, that peak of the peak tonight of 150 meteors per hour is, you know, that, that's a lot to see at a, at a given time. Uh, but again, it, as Megan said, it, it's a ramp up and a ramp down centered on tonight. And so tomorrow night, it may not be 150 an hour at the peak, but it'll be 100 an hour, which is still pretty good and you know more active than just about any other meteor shower of the year. So um, if you can't get out tonight, if it's cloudy tonight, again, wherever you are, go out after midnight and uh, uh, take a look at the night sky. Yeah, absolutely. I would second all of that. Um, so just to reiterate, what we're looking at right now is the LDT All Sky Camera. That's the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Uh, so that is Lowell Observatory's uh, probably our most well-known research telescope. Um, and I just want to point out some cool stuff that you can see on the All Sky Camera tonight. When well, other than meteors, um, number one, if you see that green crosshair sort of towards the right. Um, that is actually where the LDT is pointed right now. So people are there doing um, and observing tonight, doing research, and that is the part of the sky that they're looking at. And coincidentally enough, Nick is actually going to be observing on the LDT after this live stream later tonight. So maybe he'll talk a little bit about that in his presentation. Um, but before we get to that, I just have a couple more questions. So this one is uh, Dr. Moskovitz and Megan. How frequently do satellites interfere with your near-Earth object studies? So I would imagine he's referring to low cams. Um, and does Elon Musk's launch of Starlink satellites concern you? You want to take this one, Nick? <laughs> okay, yeah. So this, that's maybe a whole other presentation that we could give and talk about and spend an hour discussing. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about near-Earth asteroid studies, and this is Vishnu's area of expertise, Dr. Reddy's area of expertise as well, he'll be able to speak to this, that we're dependent on surveys that are out there scanning the night sky to find interesting objects for us to study. And those surveys have become incredibly efficient, where they're finding uh, hundreds of objects, hundreds of new objects per month for us to study. And then we cherry pick out the ones that we think are most interesting for a variety of scientific reasons. Uh, but those surveys are constantly grappling with sort of the false positive detections, where they found something that looks maybe like it's on an asteroid orbit, but it's not clear whether it's space junk, like an old rocket booster, or whether it's a satellite that uh, um, we're not keeping close enough tabs on. Um, uh, and so th th that's part of the game of asteroid discovery is trying to, to parse all of the stuff that's in space, not just the natural objects, but the artificial ones as well. And it's a big effort that people uh, engage in to try to keep track of those catalogs because there's, uh, it's important to keep them separate so that we know, <laughs> know where and what uh, it is we're looking at with our telescopes. Um, so satellites definitely influence the sort of discovery aspect of studying NEOs and asteroids. Um, as for the Starlink um, question, um, that again is going to influence the discovery surveys that are out there trying to scan the night sky and look for things that are moving. Um, uh, moving things are what we're interested in. The Vishnu showed this movie of Phaeton moving through a star field. That's the kind of thing that we are most interested in as scientists uh, focusing on planetary studies. And Starlink adds a lot of moving objects to our night sky and complicates that problem of trying to find novel things that uh, are worth uh, investigating scientifically. So um, I think people are thinking, starting to think very hard about the quantitative impact of constellation satellites like Starlink and how that will influence all the surveys that are ongoing and the ones that we have planned in the future. Uh, but it's very much a sort of uh, rapidly evolving playing field and we're all trying to figure out how to, how to navigate this. Awesome, thank you. Um, so one more thing on the LDT sky camera and then one question and I'll turn it over to you, Nick. 
Um, if you look at the bottom right area or the bottom left area of the LDT Sky camera, you can actually see Orion's belt pretty clearly. Now, I think that's one of the most common asterisms. Um, so hopefully everybody should be able to see that. And then up to the upper right of the of Orion's belt, you can see sort of a V. That's the Hyades, which is, um, I believe, either the or the second closest, uh, sorry, the second closest star cluster to us. Um, and that is a part of the constellation of Taurus. Believe it or not, the first closest star cluster to us is the Big Dipper. Um, I won't go into that now, though. But that general area near Orion is going to be um, essentially where the radiant of the stream is. And now if radiant is a new term for you, don't worry about it because we're going to definitely define it and go over it in a little bit. Um, so a quick question before I turn it over to you, Nick. From Fiona, what's the best way to tell the difference between a meteor and a satellite for when we are observing outside on here, and, or sorry, for when we are observing on here, as in, I believe, like in cameras and such, and then also outdoors? So outdoors, it's really easy because the satellites are going to move much slower than the meteors. The meteors are really quick flashes of light. Um, you know, last, a long meteor would be a second or two seconds or three seconds, right? Most meteors that you're going to be seeing will last for less than a second as they streak across the sky. Um, so that's much faster than any satellite. Um, so when you're sitting out there tonight and looking, that, that's, that distinction is easy to make. It's a little harder on the all-sky camera because we're looking at sort of long exposures here, exposure times of tens of seconds, maybe up to 60 seconds. And so a streak of light on that exposure could be a satellite or could be a meteor. And we often get fooled. Megan pointed out some satellites earlier um, that in those cases were easy to pick out. They had uh, very regular brightness variations across the, the trail that are indicative of that satellite rotating. Um, in a very periodic way. Um, but uh, the meteors generally will be uh, uh, more uniform along their trail in terms of the brightness, or at least gradually changing in brightness, um, as opposed to sort of periodic um, changes in brightness along that trail. Um, and typically they're, they're fainter. Um, we, we can get very bright meteors um, on that camera, and I've seen some extremely bright ones there, but uh, um, it, it, some, some of it is just kind of having a trained eye. And if we do see what we think is a real meteor, we'll get all excited and call it out for you on that, on that camera. Yeah, absolutely. And then in addition to that, once uh, I start, I'll, I'll be talking about how to view the shower and things like that. Um, but I also have a video to show you guys later on tonight um, from one of our low cams cameras, and I'll be able to point out meteors versus satellites in that video for you later on. Um, additionally, we have a question about the software being used. Um, so I'm not sure what specifically that's referring to, if they mean the all sky camera, which is an all sky camera at LDT, or if they mean, um, the software used to create the graphs in Vishnu's presentation. Um, if, uh, whoever asked that question wants to clarify it, we can swing back to it. Um, for now though, I'm going to toss it over to you, Nick, so you can. Tell us a little bit more about science. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can go into presenter mode. It didn't work when I was trying to do that for Vishnu's talk, but we'll see if it works for mine. Um, okay, so I'm going to pick up kind of where Vishnu left off, and I'm going to start by stealing the image that he put at the start of his talk because I think it's a really nice image. Um, uh, we may have just gotten an alert about a meteor on the all sky camera uh, left below Pollux. Um, so I'm going to cut my <laughs> talk short right now and, uh, uh, look at the all sky cam. Uh, yeah. Right by the, yep. uh, no, over, on oh. the, uh, over by Pollux, just above Gemini there. Um, or yes. just above Orion there. Yep, right there. All right. And then there's also a satellite going over the LDT. A satellite around mid-frame, right. yeah. <laughs> so I can't tell whether or not that's a satellite or a meteor. The the thing, the way we'll know for sure is if on the next frame that streak is still there, just Which it was. It, then that's almost certainly a satellite. 
Um, and so, oh, that's a satellite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Too bad. <laughs> False alarm. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's sometimes tough to tell, and because we saw the streak essentially sequentially on two subsequent frames uh, connecting into one another, that's a pretty clear sign that uh, um, it is uh, not affect a meteor at all. So, all right. Well, let me go back to my presentation here, and you guys can give me a heads up if uh, we we do see some uh, geminids on the L sky cam. Um, all right, so I'm going to kind of pick up where uh, Vishnu uh, left off and uh, talk talk about Phaeton, the Geminids, and, and something uh, that, that we refer to as Destiny Plus. And so I'll explain what that uh, means in, in uh, a few minutes here. Um, so I'm going to address sort of three basic questions here. I'm going to address the question of uh, why is Phaeton active? All right. This is a, a, something we are still asking, and while we think we have some insights on this, that it's very much an active area of research to try to figure out what is going on with Phaeton. Um, as Vishnu said, it's a it's an asteroid. It was discovered in this, as an asteroid, and it's not really our um, traditional uh, uh, comet that uh, we we associate with uh, meteor showers. Um, so the second point that I'll, I'll address are some of the open mysteries and un, un, unanswered questions about this link between Phaeton and the Geminids. And Vishnu touched on this a little bit, um, but there are a number of open questions related to this connection between this oddball asteroid that's not really like a comet, but in some ways is, and the Geminids. And it's those questions that to me, I think make this one of the most scientifically interesting uh, meteor showers of the year. And then lastly, what can we do to learn more, figure out some of these answers to some of these questions? What can we do in the future uh, to, to better understand Phaeton and its association with the Geminids? Nick, I hate to interrupt you, <laughs> but we have a meteor, and this time I think it's a, an actual one. Okay, all right. Um, so we're looking in the left above Orion. So this would put it right close to Gemini, even. Uh-huh, yep. Yeah. That looks promising, a little streak there. Um, again, the, the, the telltale sign will be if on the next frame, um, it, it shows up in, in that same, similar spot. Now we play the waiting game. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that concerns me a little bit about that is that there's not really a, a trailing, a brightening and a decrease across that trail. The trail itself is pretty uniform in brightness across um, across the streak. And that's a bit unusual for meteors. It's not, it doesn't, it, it's not unprecedented, but it doesn't happen all that often like that. Yeah, it looks like there's still, I don't see maybe that streak anymore, but there's still kind of a little thing above Procyon. Do you see that? I do, yeah. So I, if I had to guess that that streak that we saw in the last image and now on this one is probably a satellite, maybe just getting, uh, you yeah, know, satellites don't, generally don't have any lights or, or uh, you know, they're not self-luminous in any way. Uh, so what we're looking at is reflected sunlight. And that can really, that, that reflection can really depend on the orientation of the satellite relative to you on the Earth and where the sun is and how that reflected light uh, can be viewed or not. And so it's possible that this satellite just happened to kind of rotate in such a way that we're getting a uh, reflection of sunlight as it's over there on that part of its um, swing around the Earth. But above, above that, there's a very faint little streak that could also uh, <laughs> be a meteor. I was just wondering about that as well. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. It's a very, very active uh, satellite environment tonight. Yeah, I think I see another satellite, like right at the bottom of the image. Uh, yep, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, so no definitive meteors yet. Um, I think we're mostly just seeing satellites at this point, so. Um, all right, so if we could switch back to my talk here, I'll try to get through a few more slides before we switch back over to the all sky camera. Um, 
So uh, the, the three topics that I'm going to address here briefly are why is faith on active? What are the outstanding mysteries or open questions about the relationship between Phaethon, this comet asteroid, or uh, this rock comet, um, and the Geminid meteor shower? And how can we learn more about uh, uh, these enigmatic objects? So, so the story is going to start, the story that I'm going to tell here is going to start um, with the road outside of my house. Um, and so this uh, may be kind of an odd place to, to start, but uh, hopefully this will make sense um, in just a few minutes here. And so what we see on the, the asphalt out on the road here, um, just, just out the window there, uh, is are cracks. And cracks, you know, this type of cracking on asphalt is a uh, fairly common phenomenon, particularly in colder environments where you have large temperature swings. And up here in Flagstaff, we get uh, quite significant um, temperature swings. Um, we're you know, sort of a high arid desert climate um, and uh, can see 20, 30, even 40 degree temperature swings in a single day. And that temperature swing can have big influence on the material and the things that are present in that environment. And so we think that uh, the cracks in sidewalks and asphalt and, and roads and, and so forth, uh, parking lots uh, in uh, places like Flagstaff are driven in part by this sort of temperature swing, this thermal cycling. And that actually is quite relevant to Phaethon. And uh, uh, Vishnu uh, touched on this with uh, some, of the, uh, some of his discussion where uh, you have Phaethon on this highly elongated orbit that takes it out past the orbit of Mars and very close to the sun. It's one of the, uh, it's an asteroid that gets uh, very close to the sun, uh, much closer than most other asteroids and reaches peak temperatures of a thousand Kelvin, um, give or take, you know, 1300, 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. So the surface of Phaethon is getting quite hot. And when it comes into the sun, uh, it experiences that really intense heating, and then it goes out past the orbit of Mars and cools down significantly. So Phaethon has this uh, very intense sort of seasonal heating cycle that it experiences where um, during periods at uh, perihelion or closest approach to the sun, it's quite hot and then cools down significantly when it's out further in the solar system. Um, and this uh, temperature cycling, uh, we think, has a significant influence on the surface properties of uh, Phaethon and what happens to Phaethon, what is happening to Phaethon now. Um, and we have studied these types of processes, these types of phenomenon in a laboratory and with models and, and with observations. And here's an example of a laboratory study where um, uh, the, the authors of this, um, of this study took uh, meteorites that they think are analogous to things like Phaethon. These are the carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. They're um, some of the most primitive meteorites that we have in our collections and we think might be a decent analog to uh, Phaethon. Um, and what they did is they took these meteorites, and here's a sort of before and after shot, and they put them in an environmental chamber where they cycled the temperature on this meteorite. They just let, put it on surface and cycled the temperature. In this case, this experiment was done with a temperature swing of 190 Kelvin. So heating it up and cooling it down, heating it up and cooling it down, doing that over and over again, they did it 400 times. And what they saw is that this little piece of material here disappeared afterwards. And that this piece of material, this thermal cycling, um, actually causes the material to break down over time. This is a phenomenon known as thermal fracturing. Uh, it's similar to the, the sidewalk out in front of your house where you see those cracks that can pr be produced by the thermal cycling of, uh, of rock and uh, solid material. It's not a fast process. It's not like you go outside and you see your sidewalk cracking in real time, but it's something that happens that accumulates over time over seasonal and annual timescales. Um, these experiments suggest that um, on the order uh, on the surface of bodies like Phaethon, you can get something like um, a centimeter of crack propagation um, every decade or so on the surface of an asteroid that experiences these types of temperature swings. Now, these temperature swings are modest compared to what Phaethon experiences. Phaethon experiences maybe three or even four times this, uh, this degree of 
uh, heating and cooling cycles. So that, that sort of thermal degradation that maybe that we see happening here in the laboratory would be even more extreme on, on the surface of Phaeton. So we have laboratory experiments that suggest that thermal cycling and this unusual orbit that Phaeton is on may be contributing to the, the rocks on the surface of Phaeton breaking down um, just due to this temperature cycle. And we actually have evidence for that uh, when we look at the NEO population, the near-Earth object population as a whole. And so this is sort of the most technical graph that I'm going to show um, tonight. Uh, it's uh, a plot of the number of known um, NEOs, near-Earth objects, as a function of how close they get to the sun, where the sun is at zero and then the Earth is out here at one AU. And what we're looking at here is observations, and that's what this black line, line here is showing. So this is the observed number of NEOs that we see in the catalog of observed uh, asteroids. And when we try to model that, uh, model that um, population, we find that we require the disruption of objects with small perihelion distances. So objects that come in close to the sun have to be disrupted and actually disappear from this thermal fracturing to reproduce the observations. We can't reproduce the observations unless we allow objects that get very close to the sun, like Phaeton, to break down over time and disappear. Otherwise, our models don't describe well the, the current catalog. And so while this is not uh, specific to any one object, this is sort of a population level study that allows us to say something about the physical processes that um, are dictating uh, the, these bodies in the NEO population. So uh, coming back to this picture, which I think is a great example of what we think may be going on with Phaeton, is when it comes in close to the sun, it experiences incredible temperature uh, excursions where as, the, as it's coming in, it's hitting 1400 Kelvin. That's causing the rocks on the surface literally to break down and potentially uh, shed material uh, like is shown in this graphic here. So that this uh, material is just falling off of the surface as it reaches such extreme heats. And this is very different from uh, your sort of typical comet that you think of, where comets show activity because of the release of volatiles, ices and gases that are trapped inside the interior of the comet. Um, those vol devolatilize and sublimate off the surface, causing the activity. This is a very different physical mechanism here, where it's literally rocks breaking down under extreme heat. So kind of a cool exotic system here that we're talking about with Phaeton. So uh, Vishnu showed an example of uh, uh, the Phaeton dust tail. And this is uh, one of the space-based images of that dust tail around Phaeton. That's what this little blip of brightness is outside of uh, Phaeton. Um, and you can estimate what the total mass is that's present in that dust tail. And it's something like 30,000 kilograms, which I had to spend a little bit of time figuring out what else weighs 30,000 kilograms, but it turns out a sauropod is not a bad uh, proxy. So there's sort of like an apatosaurus worth of dust surrounding Phaeton. And so, okay, what, what does that actually mean? Well, one of the reasons that's interesting is if we look at the amount of mass that we think is present in the geminid stream, so we can measure the meteors and the geminids, and we can infer how much mass is out there in that stream of particles. The mass in the, the stream of geminids is something like a trillion kilograms, which is a lot more than 30,000. Uh, you can count the number of zeros here, and there's a lot more here than there are over here. And that's about the mass of Mount Everest. Again, I had to look up what weighs a trillion kilograms, but Mount Everest, uh, which is much bigger than a sauropod, um, uh, is how much mass we think is in that geminid stream. And this poses one of the sort of f fundamental questions about uh, the geminid phaeton connection. If you have dust that's coming off of phaeton every year that's only sort of 30,000 kilograms or so, how can you populate a trillion kilograms worth of material in that stream? And that remains a bit of an open question that we don't have a good answer for. Um, it's this would rec represent a significant fraction of the mass of Phaeton that would have had to have been lost. And so Phaeton's current level of activity just is insufficient to, to explain what we see with the Geminids. And so there's a, a, a discontinuity there that we don't fully understand. And it's one of the reasons we're interested in um, 
in, in understanding faith on better. Um, so uh, I'm going to outline some of the mysteries and then finish up by talking about what we can do to hopefully address some of these uncertainties in our understanding of this, this really cool object. Um, so Phaeton, as uh, I think this you maybe alluded to, Phaeton really hasn't been around long enough to produce all the material that we think is in that Geminid meteor stream based on the current levels of activity. Uh, Phaeton maybe has been on the orbit that it is on for tens of thousands of years, 100,000 years, probably not much more than that. It's in a kind of unstable orbit and that orbit's gonna change over time. And that's not enough time for Phaeton to populate all of the material that we see in the Geminid stream. So that's a bit of a mystery that we don't understand. And the annual Geminids are actually on a fairly recent shower. The earliest reports are really only in the early to mid 1800s, which astronomically speaking is you know, a blink of an eye. And you know, why did they only start showing up say 200, 150 years ago, we don't really know. It says something about when the showers, uh, when the stream itself was produced and when that stream and the earth started intersecting one another. But that remains kind of an open question of, of um, how the timing of those events uh, uh, correspond to one another. Uh, Vishnu uh, talked about uh, 2005 UD, which is this potential split body that looks like it's on a very similar orbit to Phaeton, and they may have split a few thousand years ago, four or five thousand years ago or something, but we don't really know the cause of separation. Uh, we, I talked about Phaeton being thermally cycled and causing material to sort of slough off the surface over time. It's not clear that that you know, sort of slow crack propagation that we, we associate with that thermal fracturing um, could actually cause a large kilometer scale body to break off the surface of, of Phaeton. It's, it's not obvious how that would actually happen. So the sort of cause of separation for these bodies, while it seems likely that it would be thermal in nature, it's unclear how that actually would have proceeded and, and why it happened a few thousand years ago and not a few tens of thousands of years, of years ago or a hundred thousands of years ago. Um, one of the things that remains an open question is why 2005 UD does not show activity. Uh, there have been attempts to look for the same kinds of activity that we see on Phaeton, but it's just not been seen on UD. And so why is an object that's experiencing very similar thermal cycling to Phaeton, why does that uh, uh, not show any signs of activity? And maybe it's just such a, a short pulse of activity that these objects experience when they're really, really up close to the sun that we just haven't been lucky enough to catch it for 2005 UD. But uh, we're interested in trying to understand why, why that is uh, the case. And then lastly, the, Vishnu alluded to this as well, that Phaeton and the Geminids are just two, part, two parts of something we refer to, it is referred to in the literature as the Geminid Phaeton complex. And so this is a complex of not just meteor showers, but asteroids as well, where we have three showers that we think all may be linked to Phaeton or maybe one of these other asteroids like 2005 UD. And then the asteroids themselves, Phaeton, 2005 UD, and 1999 YC all seem to be on these same orbits. And so there's a lot more complexity here than just a shower tonight, a meteor shower tonight, and Phaeton producing that shower. There's other asteroids involved, there's other meteor showers that are associated with these bodies. And understanding the picture involved in generating all of that sort of uh, interesting observable phenomena is very much an active area of research. So how do we learn more about all of this? How do we try to address some of these mysteries and these questions? Well, that brings us to um, uh, a JAXA, J Japanese Space Agency mission that is, um, uh, seems to be moving forward and is um, actively being developed. It has an amazing acronym uh, that, uh, uh, stands for, or the, the acronym is the Demonstration and Experiment of Space Technology for Interplanetary Voyage, Faith on Flyby Dust Science. And so that, that, that is slightly contrived uh, uh, title uh, translates to Destiny Plus. Um, and so this is an upcoming mission that JAXA plans to fly um, that will help us answer many of these key questions we have about the Geminids, Faith on 2005 UD, um, and so forth. And so I'll just finish here by talking very briefly about Destiny Plus. Um, it's something I'm very excited about because uh, Phaeton is such an unusual object. Um, 
you know, it, it, we don't, it's not often we get a chance to see such an exotic asteroid up close and Destiny Plus will uh, give us that opportunity. Um, so the, the launch is planned for around 2024 with a, um, uh, a mission that is partly science and part technology demonstration. Uh, the tech demonstration, uh, there's several aspects that will be, you know, sort of um, being tested. Uh, one of which are these very lightweight solar panels uh, because the spacecraft has to uh, get onto the sort of eccentric-like orbit to uh, fly by Phaethon, it's going to experience significant temperatures, and so there's novel uh, thermal protection uh, on board the spacecraft, and the ion thrusters that are being used on the spacecraft are a sort of next-generation device. So there's all kinds of cool tech demo going on. And then in terms of the science, uh, Destiny Plus is going to have um, a small suite of instruments, including um, a a dust analyzer um, that throughout its mission will be sampling interplanetary dust. So once it leaves the Earth moon system, um, it will be sampling dust and figuring out what the composition of that dust is. And that dust will be uh, from bodies throughout the solar system. Um, after that sort of interplanetary um, uh, uh, life, uh, the uh, plan is for Destiny Plus to fly by Phaethon in uh, the year 2028, so a little ways off, but um, uh, that will be a pretty uh, unique uh, opportunity to see Phaethon up close and personal. The, I think the flyby distance is still being worked out, but it may be on the order of a few hundred kilometers away from the surface, 500 kilometers or so from the surface. So that's really close for a planetary flyby. And then if the spacecraft survives all of that, including the flyby of Phaethon, which could be messy. There may, may be a lot of dust around Phaethon that could uh, interfere with the spacecraft. But if it survives that, then the plan is to then fly by 2005 UD after that, a couple of years later, I believe. So it's a very exciting mission, very early in the planning stages. And we're all kind of looking forward to what it will be able to teach us about um, uh, Phaethon and uh, the, the Gemini meteors uh, that uh, we're hopefully going to be uh, seeing more of tonight. So with that, I'm uh, going to close out my presentation here and uh, happy to take questions if there are any about Geminids, Phaeton, about Destiny Plus. Um, otherwise, I will uh, hand it over to Megan to um, tell you a bit more about the details of the meteor shower tonight. Thanks so much, Nick. That was really interesting. Um, we did get a couple of questions about things in the uh, LDT All Sky camera. So we're going to have another edition of Megan points things out on the LDT All Sky camera. Uh, number one, the very probably the brightest object that you can see there, almost in the middle, but slightly down to the right, that's Mars. Um, and then additionally, if you look very, very low on the horizon, I mean like very much right at the rim of the All, All Sky camera and the southern horizon, uh, slightly to the left of the little S you can see sort of two bright dots that are half in the field of view, sort of half out. Um, and I believe that's where Jupiter and Saturn are. So um, just a heads up for everybody, we have a great conjunction coming up on the 21st in which Jupiter and Saturn will be closer together than they've been for something like, I want to say a couple hundred years, if that's right. Um, so that'll be really, really cool. Definitely find a way to see that on the 21st. So not media related, but still super important, I think. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. I just want to remind everybody to post your questions in the comments. Um, anything and everything to do with meteor science, viewing the Geminids. Um, and with that, I'm going to pull up my presentation. Um, all right. Um, back a little bit. Okay, cool. So uh, before I get into how to view the shower and uh, my tips for viewing the shower and everything tonight, um, I have an opportunity to tell you guys a little bit about the next low cam system. So recently, about a week and a half ago, Nick and I went out to the Lowell Discovery Telescope site. So that's uh, where we are in the two pictures on the right. Um, and we got to install the second next generation Lowell uh, cameras for all sky meteor surveillance. So if you look um, at either one of the pictures with Nick and I in it, you can see 
um, a big white box behind us and then attach that white box, a tiny little bitty, itty bitty box with a camera mount sticking up. So that tiny box is the next generation system compared to the much larger white box behind it, which is the first generation system. Um, so we're really excited to have that up and running. Now, I think that especially when it comes to telling the public about science and about all of these like fantastic achievements that people do, a lot of times things get left out, like uh, the many, many, many things that go wrong in a couple hour install. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you guys one of the things that went completely wrong and that I had to replace. And actually, if you look at the very leftmost uh, picture, you can see uh, the computer cluster that actually controls that system. So it's uh, those that little stack of Raspberry Pis. And on top of that stack, you can see a little piece of paper taped to the top. So this is the story of how that piece of paper got there. <laughs> um, so basically what had happened was we drove out to the LDT um, site. We installed the cameras, we installed the computers, and they just wouldn't start. And that was it. And sometimes that's just all that happens. I mean, they were working before we left, we got there and they weren't working anymore. So as it turns out, the SD cards, which are the memory for these computers, got jostled around or something. And they just decided that they were going to be corrupt. Um, and as it turns out, we didn't have an SD card reader with us. So we had to leave the LDT research site, come back to Flagstaff, it took me about five minutes to figure out that all it took to fix these SD cards was plugging them into an SD card reader and plugging them into my computer. So then the next day, I drove all the way back out to the research site um, to reinstall the computers. And that little piece of paper taped to the top actually has an SD card reader inside of it. And hey, Megan, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. We do have, I think, a pretty good meteor on the All Sky camera here. Oh, really? Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, let's pull it up. Where is it? So it's uh, yeah, it's in the sort of upper left. It has you know sort of brightness variations along the trail. That's sort of a faint, faint tail that then gets brighter along that, and it's pointing back to uh, Gemini, uh, oh. which is what you would expect for a Geminid. Fantastic. The Geminids and the Lyra in the Perseids never let us down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. that was definitely that was definitely one because now there's no second trail that would you know mm -hmm. you would expect from a satellite. So that was our first validated Gemini Geminid for tonight. <laughs> yes, we got one at least. It's cause for a celebration. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna jump back to my presentation now. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Um, I just wanted to share that little story just to show that, you know, science isn't always just like you put something there and it works perfectly all the time. It's just not how it is. <laughs> um, so jumping to the next uh, slide, I'm excited to show you guys this. So this is uh, from, ooh, this video here is from the north facing uh, camera at the LDT site. So in those pictures I was just showing you. And this is a time lapse from the last clear night we had here in Flagstaff. So we sort of lucked out tonight and the clouds cleared up just in time for this live stream. But the last three nights here in uh, northern Arizona have not been clear at all. So this is from the night of the 8th to the 9th. And um, even on this night, which is definitely a couple days away from the peak tonight, we still saw almost 300 meteors in a single camera. So keep in mind, it takes us six cameras to cover the entire sky. Um, so just a single camera saw almost 300 meteors. Now I'm going to pause this video uh, because I know we had a question earlier about how to tell what's a satellite versus what's a meteor. So if I pause it at just the right spot, which is about mm, here. Oh, almost got it. That's okay. We can see in the very right when dawn is starting to come, we can see a very clear satellite kind of go across the screen. So right there, if everybody can see that, um, 
And I don't know what satellite this is exactly, but it's definitely a bright one. So this is the kind of false positives that we get in our meteor cameras. So when you ask me um, or Nick, how can you tell what's a satellite versus a meteor? Well, look at this and then look at any of the other meteors we see, like this guy, oh, this is a perfect comparison. So on the left, we see a meteor, which has brightness variations throughout it. Um, it's very small, it happens very quickly. Um, in the next frame, it'll be gone. And then on the right, you see uh, something caused by a satellite. So you can actually see very clear circles of where that satellite is. It's moving much slower, um, and there really isn't any brightness variations across that. So every time we point out, you know, something's in the all LDT All Sky camera, um, what Nick and I and Vishnu are all looking for is um, the left versus the right here. All right, so on to the Geminids. So viewing the Geminids, the Geminids, of course, uh, are in the radiant position, which is where the meteors all appear to be originating from, is in the constellation of Gemini, as the name of the meteor shower would suggest. Um, now, it's kind of cool. Gemini is uh, a zodiacal constellation, but it's not because it affects your personality if it's in the sky when you're born. That's not why it's a zodiacal constellation. It's because it's on the apparent path of the sun through the sky. So that is what makes the zodiacal constellation so special. Um, now, a good way uh, to find all of these things is actually by finding Orion first, which we were talking about a little bit. And in the next slide, I will talk a little bit about what to look for in Orion specifically. But first, I just wanted to reiterate that tomorrow is a new moon, which means viewing tonight all night, if the sky where you are is clear, is gonna be really good viewing conditions. So, um, of course, the peak of the meteor shower is at 2 a.m. That's because that's when wherever you are on the Earth at your time at 2 a.m. So real quick, if we're in the USA, 2 a.m. If you're in Europe, 2 a.m. If you're in Canada, 2 a.m. If you're in Asia, 2 a.m. Everywhere you are, 2 a.m. That is when your part of the Earth is facing directly into the meteoroid stream. That's why it's the peak. Um, but you don't need to be awake at 2 a.m. to see plenty of Geminids. Um, so I just wanted to stress that for everybody. So let's make this diagram a little bit more alike what you'll actually see in the sky. And by that, I mean, I'm going to take away all of the constellation lines and labels because those aren't just hanging out in the sky outside. And um, we're going to talk about how to actually find the radiant um, using using what you can see in the sky for real. So um, I want to talk about five things that can help you find the radiant. Um, I tried, by the way, for probably 30 minutes the other day to create an acronym out of these, and I couldn't do it. Um, I tried really hard, but I think that acronym building is just something you have to learn um, in grad school. So <laughs> to begin with number one, Orion's Belt. Um, that, of course, is probably the most easily recognizable asterism or grouping of stars right behind the Big Dipper. So um, if you can find these three stars right next to each other and a really um, good way to make sure that you're looking at Orion's belt is to also look for the sword, which is to the right of the belt. If you can see those two things together, you know you're looking in the right direction. Um, and you just want to look slightly east of that to, to find the radiant of the Geminids. And then number two is Betelgeuse and Rigel. Well, number two and three, Betelgeuse and Rigel. So that can also help you to be super extra sure that you're looking at Orion. Betelgeuse and Rigel are both two, uh, two of the brightest stars in the sky. Um, Betelgeuse, super interesting. It's a red supergiant, and it's probably going to go supernova very soon if it hasn't already. Um, we, of course, won't know that until the light has time to travel to us. Um, but you can't miss it. It's very, very red. Rigel is sort of the exact opposite. It's a blue supergiant, so it's very, very blue. But they're both very, very bright. So if you can find the belt, look around for Betelgeuse and Rigel, and you'll feel super confident that you're looking in the right area. And then number four, Sirius, the dog star, is the brightest star in the sky, period. End of story. So if you just look for the brightest star that you can find, uh, make sure it's not a planet. That would be serious, and you know that you're looking in at least the right direction. Once again, the Geminids would be east of that. And now number five, this is sort of like my challenge 
find these objects um, for the beginners in the audience um, at amateur astronomy. Castor and Pollux are the heads of Gemini. So the Gemini constellation, of course, means the twins. Castor and Pollux in Greek mythology are those twins. So um, one or both of them are sons of Zeus, that's debated, uh, but they're very well known in mythology. They were on the Argo with Jason to get the golden fleece uh, for all of my Greek mythology nerds out there. Um, but Castor and Pollux are the two heads of Gemini and the Geminids, of course, is pretty much right next to them. So if you can find Castor and Pollux, you're looking at the radiant. All right, um, and Last but not least, I have my reminders here. So the best time to view, um, I say all night. Once again, the peak, the true peak is 2 a.m., but all night, really, you're going to be seeing a ton of meteors. Um, I don't know about my fellow hosts tonight, but I do not like staying up till 2 a.m., and I also don't like waking up at 2 a.m. So I'll probably be out around midnight, and that's just fine. Um, the radiant direction, once again, is east, so if you want to take the challenge of finding some of those objects I just pointed out, go for it. Uh, if you don't want to deal with that, which I totally get, just look to the east or anywhere else in the sky because meteors will be found all over the sky. And then the biggest reminder I can give you is to just relax and be patient. It's going to take some time. You're not going to look up at the sky and immediately see lots of meteors. So get into a comfortable position, make sure you're wearing warm clothes or with somebody that you can stand and um, just look for some of those meteors. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Oh, and I didn't put it on the slide, but one more reminder, 2 a.m., wherever you are, 2 a.m. is the peak. Okay, not Eastern time, not West Coast time, 2 a.m. every time. All right, so let's jump back to the LDT All Sky camera now okay well let's see we looks like we got a couple of questions coming in so the first one from bruce does the iss notice any increase in damage when passing through these debris fields Vishnu, you want to take that you may have a, a better uh, answer to that than i do i mean the chance of iss actually getting hit by a meteor is relatively small um, you know the sky is vast so you know you're not really in any media threat, of course, during any meteor shower, there's a calculated risk because, as you can see, uh, you know these are coming through the atmosphere. What we're seeing is only about a hundred mile phenomenon, but ISS is much higher than that. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I don't think it's any any greater risk unless it actually runs into the stream itself. You know, at any particular point. Uh, and there's also, you know, an inclination aspect of it's the IRS's orbit itself. So that uh, gives it some, you know, advantages uh, over regular, you know, uh, Earth orbiting uh, satellites, let's say. I, I know that occasionally satellites will be put into a safe mode. And I don't know if the ISS has ever had to, you know, move out of the way or anything like that. But occasionally... Debris, I think they do. Yeah, for debris, they do conjunction maneuvering, you know. Uh, to avoid uh, try and avoid others, you know, satellite or debris coming there. You know, yeah. the, the best situation is when both objects can maneuver, and of course, the worst is when both cannot maneuver. Then you know, you, you yeah. pray at that point. Uh, but you know, that the 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 maneuvering of ISS has become increasingly, you know, more common. Let's say, like you mentioned before, you know, with the launch of things like Starlings and things like that, there's more commerce in space. Which also generates more debris. You know, that's the by just the byproduct of human activity anywhere we go, and so that that has to be factored in. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want to remind everyone we're coming up towards the end of the live stream. So if you do have any lingering questions, throw those in the chat now. Um, that's all we're doing now is answering questions and looking for meteors. Um, so uh, another question from. Maka accounts, um, are any of these meteors large enough to ever make it through the atmosphere? And I believe that would be called a meteorite. <laughs> if you want to expand on that, Nick. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, this is the true meteorite expert here. Um, yeah, so uh, before a meteor hits the atmosphere, we refer to it as a meteoroid. If we observe that meteoroid coming in through the atmosphere and appearing as this flash of light, that's a meteor. 
And the largest meteoroids that survive to the ground become meteorites. Um, and we have a vast collection of meteorites uh, here on Earth, uh, pieces of rock that have survived that violent passage to the atmosphere and landed on the ground. Um, generally, meteorite uh, producing impactors um, are much larger, significantly larger than what we're seeing tonight. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the number that people typically talk about in terms of having to be large enough to survive through the atmosphere would be uh, a meteor, meteoroid that's maybe a meteor, meteor or two across, so sort of human-sized rock out in space can survive passage through the atmosphere and land on the ground. Anything smaller than a meter or two is just going to vaporize and turn to dust. And so all of the meteors that we're seeing tonight are, as Vishnu said, grains of sand. Maybe, you know, if we're lucky, we'll get a pea-sized uh, meteor tonight. But those entirely vaporize, and none of the geminids that come in tonight will be producing rocks on the ground. Now that you say it, it'll happen, right? Right, of course. <laughs> Um, okay, another question. Um, are shooting stars comets or meteors? I guess that depends on what you call a shooting star. I think typically for most people, they're meteors. Um, comets uh, actually linger around in the sky for a while when we can see them, maybe a couple days. Um, so moving on, next question. Uh, please explain the colors as they burn. Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, and I would say it's not terribly well understood. And one of the reasons it's not terribly well understood in detail is because these things are hitting at such high speeds that we can't really replicate it in the laboratory very well. Uh, typical meteor impact speed would be 30, 40, 50,000 miles per hour, which is pretty fast. And we just can't accelerate pieces of material that fast in the laboratory to be able to study what color they make when they start to vaporize. And so that makes it really hard to study and understand. We, we do understand that the different colors um, are a function of uh, composition. So some meteors may have more sodium, some meteors may have more iron, some more calcium, so on and so forth. And those um, colors uh, are a reflection of that abundance of the elements that are present in the meteor. Um, or the meteoroid. And so as that meteoroid is being vaporized, the, the light you're seeing are um, uh, transitions, atomic transitions associated with the ionization of those, that, that material. Um, and so the material dictates what, what the color turns out to be. Um, so I don't have a good answer uh, other than it's composition and different meteors have different compositions. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Um, uh, another question, what is the biggest meteor shower e each one of us has ever seen? Um, I'll start since my answer is probably the shortest. Uh, the Perseids, every year. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't say I've been, and seen any of these, you know, really you know, famous historic outburst or showers or anything like that. And you can, you know, Google meteor storms or meteor hurricanes. And there are some very famous events in history where you know, we're talking about um, uh, zenith hourly rates or hourly rates for the meteors tonight of 150 per hour. And there are reports in history of meteor showers that produced thousands or even hundreds of thousands of meteors per hour, which would be truly spectacular. That's you know, sort of once in a lifetime kind of thing or even less frequent than that. Um, I think the best maybe uh, for me was probably Perseids. Uh, if I had to put a year on it, it was probably around 2008. It was a pretty spectacular shower. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, the Geminids are hard, particularly here in Flagstaff, because it's so cold outside. It's hard to sit out there for very long. You know, it's probably going to drop into the teens tonight, and I'm not looking forward to being out there for very long. <laughs> Dr. Reddy, do you have a favorite okay. shower? Okay. Yeah, mine I would say is uh, the 1999 Leonid meteor storm. So, I, you know, I was I was living back in India back then, and uh, it, it was pretty impressive. So I I I, uh, I did 11 night observing run, uh, doing uh, visual counting on meteorites. So we had a little tape recorder, and you record every time you see a meteor meteor go by. You, you, measure the magnitude with your eyeballs, basically comparing brightness with stars. 
And so I think that the the the, fi the final night, you know, I think we saw in the order of like I think one every second, and they were fireballs. You know, they were wow. big. You know, they, yeah, it was a storm. You know, and they were, it was kind of scheduled in such a way that it peaked over India and then it went over Europe. So India and Europe got the the, the kind of the brunt of it. Uh, so and then we saw a lot of uh, you know like doubles, like you know two two uh, you know fireballs trailing each other. Uh, so. So anyway, so that, that that was you know definitely I don't think I, I can top that off in my lifetime. It was it was it was it was also the you know the uh, you know I usually observe it with my dog, which is no longer there. So I have a lot of you know dog noises and conversations with my dog because you know you you're, you have nobody else right. You're quite observant. So <laughs> the only audio recordings of my my long past dog that I still have. So. <laughs> That's fantastic. And I think, you know, for people that may want to catch a meteor storm, the next Leonid storm prediction is 2031, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so wait a few years and that may be your next best shot. But I'm going to go wherever you are, Vishnu, so I get a chance to <laughs> see in one a second. <laughs> yeah, I got lucked out. You know, that was pretty impressive. But I did 11 night observing them, so I saw the full, you know, ramp up. That's so incredible. The observation still, so. Yeah, that's incredible. I'm extremely jealous, honestly. <laughs> uh, I'll definitely be marking my calendar for 2031. Uh, so I think that's the last of the questions, um, but I have a question for you, Nick. Do you think that you're going to get a lot of Geminids in your viewing tonight at the LDT? Um, you know, probably not. Uh, and part of the reason for that is the, the field of view that we look at with LDT is incredibly small. And so the chance of a meteor passing through that is very, very tiny. So I, I would say the, the chances for that are not, not terribly good. Um, I, ha I have had cases, though, where a telescope is pointing at the right place at the right time and happened to pick up a meteor streaking through it. So it does happen. But um, the field of view on the, the lar that large telescope is so tiny compared to the you know, scale of the sky that's just um, uh, not, not too likely that we'll get one. Um, so I am being told that there's a meteor. Oh, wow, in the upper right, bright yeah. one. That's a very bright one. That one's nice. That's awesome. Just in time. Yeah. I don't think it's a Geminid, though. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be pointing in the right direction. Um, yeah, uh, you would expect that tail to be pointing back towards uh, Gemini. Mm -hmm. but that is uh, definitely a nice meteor. Yeah, definitely. A um, couple more questions. So what is the average size? Um, I'm going to assume that that's what is the average size of a Geminid meteor, of a Geminid meteoroid. Do you, does either one of you know off the top of your head? I think grain of sand um, is, is a good analogy. We're talking about things that are millimeter scale at best. Um, so these are small little little fragments. Yeah, I think grain of sand, you know, like it's a little fingernail, biggest ones, fireballs. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, most of the energy is coming from the velocity, not the mass, so. Mm -hmm. um, Next question, uh, are there any meteors with unknown periodic elements? So I think um, we could extend that to maybe parent bodies as well. So I think, yeah, I, I think there are meteors and asteroids out there in space that have material on them that is rare on Earth. Um, and you know, one example, one clear example of that are iron meteorites or iron rich asteroids. Um, iron is actually pretty rare on the surface of the earth with the exception of human related activity. Um, so we do, um, we, we do see material that's rare and rare here on earth, sometimes abundant in space. But I don't think there are any gaps in the periodic table that, uh, um, we have not explored here on Earth that we might uh, find find out in space. Uh, there are exotic compounds, you know, exotic minerals uh, that may occur in space and not necessarily here on Earth. Vishnu may be able to speak to that uh, better than I can, but I think you know we understand the periodic table pretty well and have it pretty well inventoried. Uh, yeah, I think you know. Here on Earth. 
Yeah, the challenge is like it's a lot easier to go outside and see a meteor through your, with your eyes than it is to capture with a camera, and it's that much harder to get a spectrum of it. You know, uh, even if you can capture a meteor, a meteor on a camera. So, and then even when you get a spectrum, you can't tell a whole lot. You know, you kind of can guess that it's you know it, it, these are these elements, but again, you know, it, you know. Not they're not very uniform, you know. It's getting you know we have to deal with saturation. Uh, you know, there's lots of challenges doing meteor spectroscopy, but so far I don't think they've found anything too exotic uh, as far as you know the elements on the in, on the meteor meteors itself or the, the parent object itself. Um, and and I think Nick, you placed it well. You know, most of the heavy metals on the Earth are you know deep deep below in the core because of differentiation. And occasionally, you know, we, we get lucky with the uh, you know, seams of ore that we pull out and we're able to produce everything that we see on the earth, you know, but the majority of it is deep down. And that's why asteroids become a, a you know, a, a favorable target uh, for mining and stuff like that, because, you know, everything is exposed, right? You know, over the course of uh, solar system history, big collisions have ex excavated, you know, their parent bodies and the cores are exposed and, you can, you know, if you can get there and mine it and bring the material back, back then you have a, a, a way of using the, you know, um, elements, you know, so to speak, than say on Earth, you know, where we have to dig really hard, especially for, you know, rare Earth elements that we use in electronics and everything else. So there's a, a question that came in about Apophis. Um, and it's a, it's a little peripheral, but you know we'll try to try to at least address briefly all the all the all the questions that come in. So Apophis, uh, for those who may not know in the audience, is a, uh, when it was discovered uh, was uh, one of the most hazardous asteroids known at the time. There was a predicted impact, actually a non-zero impact probability in uh, 2029. That has now been ruled out, and we've been able to determine that Apophis is going to miss us. It's going to fly by. It's actually on Friday the 13th, uh, Friday, April 13th in uh, 2029. Apophis is going to fly by at a distance of four or five Earth radii or something like that. So it's a, it's a close shave, uh, but not actually going to hit us, which is good. Um, one of the interesting things that's coming up next month actually is Apophis is going to be uh, favorably observable with the ground-based telescopes next month. And uh, that's sort of the last opportunity to study that asteroid before it flies by in 2029. So there'll be a lot of activity surrounding uh, Apophis and trying to figure out what it looks like, what its properties are. And that's really all about setting the baseline to look at what may change with the object when it flies by in 2029, because it comes so close to us, it's going to feel intense tidal stresses from the earth that will change its rotation and maybe even cause uh, earthquakes or asteroid quakes that could shake the body and cause landslides and things like that. So it's an interesting geophysics experiment that we'll be looking forward to in 2029. And I know Vishnu is organi organizing a, um, or helping to organize a campaign surrounding the 2021 apparition of Apophis to characterize and study the object um, as part of a planetary defense exercise. Uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Vishnu. Yeah, I think amateurs, uh, if you have a little telescope that you can take pictures of Apophis, you can participate. So uh, we have something called the International Asteroid Warning Network. Uh, it is loosely associated with the United Nations. So it's kind of like the coalition of the willing, you know, you know, it's you know, uh, tracking hazardous asteroids and, you know, finding ways to mitigate if one were to be found to be headed towards the earth. It's not just a problem for people here in the United States. It's a global problem. So we want to share the responsibilities of such a task. And part of that, uh, you know, uh, responsibility is to exercise the operational readiness of different telescopes around the world. So we kind of do like, you know, a little uh, science exercise where everybody coordinates and tries to observe an object and then we have uh, people doing impact modeling. You know, they change the numbers a little bit and try and see what happens if they were to hit the Earth. You know, they're not going to hit the Earth, but if they were to hit the, what are the effects on the ground and things like that. So in this case, we have Apophis coming, like Nick said, next year. Uh, so it'll be bright enough for amateurs to observe. So probably sometime in late February, mid to late February. And so uh, we're looking for amateurs to contribute uh, light curve observations. So as, you know, basically as the asteroid rotates. The amount of light coming off it uh, changes because, you know, as you can see, you know, some of the asteroids are potato shaped, right? So 
where the surface area changes as it rotates. And so uh, that kind of gives us information about how fast it's rotating. So we want amateurs worldwide to participate in that activity. So if you have a tall scope, you're interested in doing this stuff, you know, contact us and then we'll be happy to put you to touch. There are different working groups. Uh, so the person doing, you know, the coordination for the light curve work is an astronomer located in South Africa. So he's going to help you put a lot of that together. Uh, but, you know, I kind of, I'm the chief wrangler, like Nick mentioned, it's like, you know, I heard cats, you know, but, you know, our astronomers. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, all right. Next question. We have a couple built up. I know we're coming up on 930, but I think uh, we should at least try to get through all the questions that have already come in. Um, so do any of the meteors or meteoroids bounce off of our atmosphere or is that just a sci-fi myth? Absolutely. We have recorded meteors with video camera systems showing a, a meteor streak. And when you fit the orbit to that streak, you see that it didn't actually penetrate into the atmosphere, but just sort of grazed us and kept on going out into space. And whether material survived that grazing impact is, uh, we may never know, but um, definitely there are documented cases of meteors come, meteoroids coming in and essentially skipping off the atmosphere. Cool. So more like a skip than a bounce. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, <laughs> not qualified to make that distinction. Uh, I think, wait, I think you're the most qualified to make that distinction. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, next question. Uh, has there ever been any dead or alive bacteria or fungus found on meteorites? Uh, it would certainly be interesting if there were that there's never been anything confirmed. No, um, that's a, maybe a topic of a whole other uh, presentation. And we maybe don't want to open up that can of worms or can of bacteria. I would say it depends upon how long it's been sitting on the earth. <laughs> yeah, right. As long as it says the chances are higher that it will have something. Yeah, that's yeah, true. That's <laughs> um, okay. Um, two more questions that I have here. So first one, do you guys take spectra of meteors? If so, have you detected any hydrocarbons? That's a good question. Uh, people do take spectra of meteors. It's really hard because they're such short-lived phenomena and you don't really know where to point your instrument to be able to collect the spectrum. Um, so you need pretty sophisticated systems to be able to do that. Uh, but people do and people have collected spectra. Um, I think the, uh, um, what you see in the meteor spectrum is essentially atomic lines, uh, atomic ionization lines in, uh, in that spectrum. Um, so you're looking at elemental compositions and not necessarily isolating out hydrocarbons or complex molecules. It's more about, okay, well, I see carbon or I see sodium or I see calcium. And you're able to identify those elements, but not necessarily breaking it down or uh, being able to get large scale molecular information. Um, so I, I, while spectra have been taken, I don't think detection of hydrocarbons has been, has been achieved. Awesome, thank you. Um, so last question, which I think is a lot like the one we had about the ISS a couple questions back, but how safe are our satellites from meteors? Um, so maybe you just wanna reiterate about that quickly. Do you want to take that one, Vishnu? You want me to? Sure. Yeah, you go ahead, Nick. You can talk about the recent, uh, the, the NEA that came by. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, our, our, in general, our satellites are pretty safe. And we, you know, have active efforts to uh, monitor near Earth space. And uh, in some cases, even space junk we try to keep track of. Uh, there's a whole catalog of space junk out there that is maintained so that if there is a predicted encounter between one of our satellites and say something that could hit that satellite, there, there can be efforts made to mitigate that risk. Um, you know, uh, I, I think there are a few, very few documented cases of satellites being you know, knocked out of commission by a meteor. There's a few cases of 
um, power surges and things like that on um, on satellites that are probably due to a meteor hitting, say, a solar panel or something like that. But uh, it's not something that happens very often, and precautions are taken when when possible. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Um, I just want to reiterate before we sign off that uh, the peak, the peak of the peak, which is tonight, is 2 a.m. Uh, your local time. So wherever you are, don't care where it is, 2 a.m. That time, your time zone, 2 a.m. Um, otherwise, though, you should get pretty good views all night long because we have a new moon tomorrow. So you don't have to worry about all of that light pollution, thankfully. Um, in addition to that, if it is cloudy where you are, don't panic. You still have plenty of nights from now, maybe two or three nights from now to see a fair amount of meteors per hour. So uh, the Geminids, they're not just a one night thing. Um, additionally, I just wanted to mention that the great conjecture of Jupiter and Saturn is going to be happening on the 21st. Jupiter and Saturn will be closer together than they've been in hundreds of years, I believe it is. Uh, and we're going to be having a live stream, not, not us specifically, but Lowell Observatory will be having a live stream to talk about that on the 21st if you can actually get out and observe it yourself. Um, so with that, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to Dr. Reddy and thanks to Dr. Moskovitz for being here. Um, this is super fun as always, and um, I hope we'll see you on, during the next meteor shower. So good luck, everybody viewing, and stay warm. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.